All right, welcome. We're here with the ladies at Annie's Hope, and they're going to be discussing grief with us. Um, my name is Emily, and I work with Parents as Teachers as a parent educator. It is a free program for parents to help uh, support uh, other parents in raising their kiddos the way they want to. So, ladies, I'm going to let you take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having us. My name is Caitlin. I am the program director at Annie's Hope. And my name is Cindy, and I am the school support and education coordinator at Annie's Hope. And so we are going to be um, sharing a little bit about what Annie's Hope is, who we help to support, and then also how to help support um, grieving kids in your um, family or in your life. So I'm going to start my presentation. Can you all see the whole screen? Yeah, I can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So um, I'm going to let Cindy go ahead and introduce Annie's Hope. Okay, so uh, the mission of Annie's Hope is to provide comprehensive support services to children, teens, and their families who are grieving a death. Um, and we uh, that is specifically a death um, of a person, um, but we don't specify the relationship to the person um, or the cause of the death um, or the time frame from the death. And our vision is to be the first choice grief center in the St. Louis area. So Annie's Hope offers 10 different programs and services. Um, so I will give a brief overview of each one of them. Um, so our family support groups um, take place here at our location uh, in the Webster Kirkwood area. Um, and they are an evening program that meets once a week for eight weeks. Um, they are geared to support kids ages three to 18. Um, and then we also ask that a supportive adult in the kid's life uh, joins us for that evening as well. Um, they are peer support programs uh, and in a group setting, um, kids are divided into groups based on their age um, and then parents or guardians or caregivers um, are in an adult group as well. And ahead of time, we offer um, a complimentary optional dinner uh, that families are welcome to join us because we, we recognize that uh, grief can be a time um, of chaos and uh, it can be hard to um, maintain that, that sort of structure. And so um, we welcome families to join us for that time as well. Our school support and education program, um, we support uh, kids in schools. Um, so we go to different schools in the St. Louis area and provide six weeks of a group um, for kids there um, in that setting. We also can provide support to schools um, after a death has occurred in their community. Um, so whether that is our six-week support um, or a shorter period of crisis and whatever that may look like when there is a death, um, what the school may be needing. Um, we have a camp program. So our Camp Courage and Camp Courage Teens is a one-week program in the summer um, that uh, we, it, we take students to um, and kids and teens to a campsite um, not too far from our office. It's about 40 minutes um, from the Webster Kirkwood area. Um, and it's a mix of grief processing as well as just time to have fun and, and be a kid and do typical uh, camp activities. That is a one week program. Our teen retreats um, are a weekend long, um, more condensed version. So it's at that campsite. Um, we're doing a lot of fun um, leadership and, and team building activities while also processing grief work. And it's a little bit more heavy focused um, in that grief processing work as compared to the camp program. Horizons 
is our anticipatory grief program. So while most of our programs are geared towards after death has occurred, uh, we also recognize that grief happens um, from the time that you know that a death may be occurring. Um, So this is uh, a program that supports that time frame uh, leading up to the death. And um, that program meets families where they're at. So that could be in the home, that could be um, in a hospital, that could be uh, at a library or a coffee shop, um, wherever that family is most comfortable. Um, Our family social events are less grief focused and more an understanding that kids need time and space to be a kid and have fun. Um, So we have, um, we go to sports events like Cardinals and Blues games. Um, We have movie nights, yoga nights, um, all sorts of fun things. Uh, Our hope and healing gathering is once a year. And that is a time to recognize that the holidays can be especially hard um, and, you know, when you're grieving. And so um, it's a time to remember and pay tribute to that person, um, as well as build that support system uh, leading into the holidays. Our Speakers Institute are presentations like this um, that occur in schools and communities and organizations um, about various topics, um, Annie's Hope and grief related. Um, Our grief referral service is a recognition that while all of our programs are um, peer support group based, um, that having that individual counseling uh, can be really important. Um, for some folks. Uh, And so that is an opportunity. We keep a list of um, different providers, counselors, therapists, psychologists in the area who specialize in or are very comfortable working in grief. Um, And we also recognize that there are there's grief from things that are not death. And so uh, we keep the list updated for that as well. So we can refer out for those services. And then our last one is our community resource library. So we keep a library of, uh, and it is a full service lending library, um, of different books on grief related topics for all ages. So for kids, for their families, for their caregivers, um, for schools, for professionals, um, on a variety of topics related to grief. And at Annie's Hope, we have no affiliation with any healthcare system, religious group, university, or any other entity or organization. Um, All of our programs and services are also offered to grieving kids and families at no cost. So we are funded through grants and donations, um, and that is not a basis um, for whether or not a family receives our services. So this is just... um, some statistics. Um, so looking at why why does this topic matter? Um, one, we know that one in 12 kids in Missouri will grieve the death of a parent or a sibling by the age of 18. Um, and that is also notable because Missouri is actually higher than the national average. So um, one in 12 translates to about 8.6% of kids. Um, which is higher than the national average of about 7.3. And that's not also recognizing, um, you know, deaths of other relationships. So this is specific to parent and sibling, but there are many relationships um, that a child would have that could be agreed. So we also believe that grief is universal, normal, and natural. Um, It is a response to a loss. Uh, Support and education can help families through the grieving process, but we also recognize there is no single path towards healing. So there's no one right or wrong way to grieve. Um, We also know that grief is a lifelong process. So it's the goal isn't really to get over it. Um, It's to discover a new relationship with the deceased, uh, recognizing that that physical presence isn't there, um, but the love and the memories are still there. 
And of course, if given a safe and trusting place um, with lots of support, we believe that every child has the ability to heal and live a productive and joyful life. So even while grief is not something that we get over, um, there's also, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be a negative force for the rest of the child's life. So how do kids grieve? Um, we recognize that kids of all ages grief, uh, grieve. It's not just adults. And also kids grieve differently than adults because kids are different than adults. Um, they, how they do that is going to depend on their developmental age. Uh, we also know that the number one way to predict the manner in which a child will grieve is by observing the parent or guardian. So how a parent or guardian caregiver is grieving um, is modeling grief for their child. Kids can also be protective of adults and protective of others. Um, and then kids grieve in small doses. So their attention span um, and their ability to process something as large and heavy as grief um, is going to be shorter. So it may seem that they're uncaring or unemotional um, when in reality they need that time and space uh, to grieve and then they're going to have time and space where they're focusing on other things. We also know that kids need to say goodbye. So that's not to say that they have to um, physically be able to say goodbye to that person before the death, um, but having some recognition of a transition. Um, and we also facilitate that in our support groups and in our programs at Amy's Hope. Um, so that can look like um, memorial services or other grief rituals um, that may naturally be built into your family traditions. Um, and that may be things like making memories um, or carrying on that relationship to the deceased. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how kids grieve differently based on their developmental um, understanding and developmental age. And so as Cindy mentioned, kids do grieve and kids grieve at every age. And so just as adults grieve, kids grieve too. But that can look different and can be expressed different depending on the age of the child. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about what you could um, maybe see in an infant, um, how that might be different than toddlers, preschool age, and then also talking about the young um, school age child as well. And so how that is going to be developmentally different and carried on through um, the different ages. And what we do know about grief is that it's a lifelong journey. Um, we grieve someone for our entire life. And so there may be times where we, um, as a child is moving through a developmental age and moving into a different developmental age, they may um, be resurfacing and having questions come up for them and um, transitioning into a different period in their grief that might bring up things for them. So this will be, um, we're gonna talk about infants and toddlers to start with and give you a little bit better idea of what you might um, see in an infant and toddler that's grieving. And then we'll also talk about how do we support these kids at these ages. So developmental considerations for an infant and toddler. Um, for infants, the largest concern is often the separation or the change in routine. Um, what we do know about um, infants and toddlers is that they don't understand that most parts or any parts of the true meaning of death. And so they cannot comprehend that um, all lives die and that once dead, always dead. And so there are pieces of their grief that are very different than the other kids that we will talk about developmental considerations for. Um, so grief may show up for um, ages zero to three um, years in, they may be crying more, becoming more irritable, um, gassy bellies, changing in eating or sleeping. They may present with rashes. 
And then for toddlers, um, their main question and concerns are, who will care for me now? So the toddler is really just thinking from their own perspective, um, their, the world exists just for them. And so they're wondering who is going to be their caretaker now? Who is going to take care of them? Who's going to do those duties or jobs that maybe that person did for them? So for support um, at this age, um, supporting a grieving infant and toddler can be physical touch and holding, um, maintaining routine and caregivers. So as I mentioned, um, the separation of that relationship or that attachment is um, going to be the biggest concern for this age group. And so providing that attachment and filling that hole of where that individual was and supporting that child um, can be ways of building that attachment in. And so they're going to grieve the loss of that attachment or the missing of that um, care. And so maintaining a routine and maintaining a routine around caregiving um, can be helpful for that. And then using a calm, soothing voice. Um, infants and toddlers um, pick up on our changes in our body and our um, things that we're expressing in our feelings. And so um, maintaining calmness and talking with them in a calm voice can be ways that we can express safety to them and comfort to them. Allowing for safe expression of emotions. So as I mentioned, they may be crying more, they may be more irritable. So allowing for that expression to happen. Giving time and space for joy, fun, and laughter. So really connecting with them and, and knowing that kids need that um, time for play and joy and fun. And so providing those opportunities um, for them. So as we transition into thinking more about the preschool age child, um, we're talking about children ages three to five years old. And so grief is gonna look a little different for them. Um, they, the preschooler knows the difference between self and non-self um, and death can happen to someone else and not be a part of them. So they're really still at that beginning stages of understanding the concepts of death and um, they can understand that death can happen, um, but that it's harder for them to relate it to themselves or that it could be a part of their life or a part of them. And so for three to five year olds, death is temporary and reversible. Uh, death is mostly a matter of separation. Um, death only happens to other people. So they don't fully understand that every living thing um, will die. And um, death persons or animals are broken and can, dead persons or animals are broken and can be fixed or they're sleeping and can be awakened or they're gone and will come back. So that permanency of death is really not a concept that they fully understand at this age. Around the ages of four and five in this time frame, um, the preschooler may become interested in death and dead bodies, and the child may want to see or touch the deceased person. So that's not uncommon um, after someone in their life has died for that age to ask for that. So their um, feeling and vocabulary may be limited at this age, um, you know, talking about things in sadness, mad, scared, happy. We know preschoolers are really growing their vocabulary around feelings at this time. And so um, these are going to be ways that they're going to be expressing those very complicated feelings of grief um, with their limited vocabulary. And preschoolers often believe thoughts, wishes, and behaviors have power. And so they can um, cause guilt from, this can cause guilt from a false cause and effect. And so they have a really powerful mind. You know, we talked about that limited vocabulary, but they really have this wonderful creative mind. And um, that can lead to them linking things or connecting cause and effects that don't actually exist or wouldn't make sense to an adult um, and have that that natural progression of cause and effect. So um, having some really concrete language um, for preschoolers is really helpful with understanding this. And at three to five um, years old, thinking can be magical. So two plus two doesn't always equal four. Um, so 
along those lines of them having those misunderstandings about death that it can it's broken and fixed is that language that we can use and so we'll talk a little bit more about the language that can be helpful with kids at this age and um, young school age children with helping them understand these really big concepts of death and dying um, and so again at this age they're still um, egocentric the world exists around the child and so um, they're really looking from things from their own perspective rather than from a peer's perspective or a friend's perspective or a parent's perspective at this age too um, cartoons can be really confusing because we learn from um, cartoons or tv shows that um, once dead doesn't always mean dead and so that kind of misunderstanding can happen and can be reinforced by um, cartoons and tv and those types of things um, young children may not react to or appear to um, have a uh, caring or they may appear to be uncaring or unemotional when they're told about a death. And um, it's very common for a kid at this age to maybe ask one or two questions and then want to go and play or um, find joy in their day. And that's because preschool age children take um, take grief in small doses. Um, so they are really um, only able to hold on to grief topics for a short period of time, just as their attention span is um, more limited at this age. So is their attention to grief and ability to kind of stay in those grief conversations for a longer period of time. So, um, Supporting a preschool age child. We can offer them comfort through hugs, kisses, and holding. Um, so that really that feeling of connection and touch, um, similar to the infant and toddler, but then progressing into this age as well, um, that they need that sense of security and safety um, and comfort. Answering questions um, repeatedly with patience. So I mentioned that they might have a few questions that they might ask you. Um, and they're going to ask those questions again and again because that's how they are processing this information. Just like with kids at this age, they ask a lot of questions about all different types of topic. And grief, death, and dying is no different. Um, so prepared to answer questions and answer them again and again. Um, and that's just part of their understanding, their ability to comprehend these really big um, ideas and concepts. Avoid double meaning and confusing phrases such as grandma is sleeping or mommy went to heaven. Um, we lost grandpa last night. And so these are really common phrases that we use when talking about death and dying. And the reason why they're confusing at this age is because they're not fully um, understanding the permanency of death. And so when we sleep, we wake up. And um, sleeping does not represent the permanency of death. And there could also be some um, fear that's associated with that. If grandma's sleeping and she's not coming back, then I don't want to go to sleep. And so it could cause some um, irritability at bedtime and some troubles with sleeping or falling asleep, nightmares, um, those types of things are, when using that language. Um, you know, spiritual beliefs is um, important and can affect, but it um, can be helpful for kids in, in coping and um, is an important part of it. So this phrase about mommy went to heaven, just providing some additional information for the child to be able to understand what death means. Um, oftentimes kids will express that they want to go to heaven too. Why can't they go there? Why can't it be this place that they visit um, and be able to see this person? And so when talking about death, we often use language um, in terms of the body. So um, we talk about how the body has stopped working. And when a body stops working, it stops working forever. And um, a body stops working when our, we no longer are breathing, we can no longer eat, we no longer sleep or feel or touch or taste or hear or see things. Um, so our body has stopped working, which means that our heart has stopped beating. And so talking about the body in that more physical sense um, can be helpful for kids with understanding um, grief, death, and dying. 
So allowing children to play out their grief concerns and questions. So play at this age is so important. Play is the work of the child. Um, so allowing them those opportunities to have play and use imaginative play. And um, you'll often see themes of death and dying coming up and in their play. And that's okay. That's normal. That's the way that they're working through and processing this information that's very new to them. So they'll maybe um, explore those themes of concerns and fears that they have through their play. And show your emotions without overwhelming them. Show your feelings, allow them to show their feelings. So sharing, um, as Cindy mentioned, the most um, number one predictor of how kids are gonna grieve is how the role models in their life are, are role modeling grief. Um, so modeling sharing of emotions and showing that you, know, that you have emotions too um, without overwhelming them. Because as Cynthia also mentioned that they wanna take care of you. And so um, children learn that if um, they they're sometimes are concerned about overwhelming you or um, making the parent cry or making them upset. Um, and so maybe they don't share their emotions as much. So it's that balance of um, modeling that sharing of emotions and sharing of feelings too, without making them feel overwhelmed. And then being direct and honest with um, conversations about how the person has died. So I mentioned to you about magical thinking and putting cause and effect. And that's why Annie's Hope really suggests um, providing a clear, um, concrete response to how the person died. Um, and that is sometimes more challenging when the death is a little more complicated to understand. So um, we we suggest offering an honest response that is developmentally appropriate. So sharing just the basic information and then allowing the child's questions to guide how you, what information you share more of, um, because they're gonna tell you what they wanna know, what are the things that are sticking points for them. So allowing their questions to guide how you share about the death. So that's the grieving preschooler. Um, some of the things I wanted to just mark before we move on to the school age child is that um, the preschooler may show their grief by clinging to their caregiver more, um, fears of further losses or separations of death. So if one um, parent or guardian dies, they may be really heightened concerned about the other parent or guardian dying as well. Um, that increase in nightmares that I mentioned around bedtime, um, death themes being present in their play, changes in sleeping or eating patterns, um, sometimes regressive behaviors. So um, at preschool age, um, they are working on um, potty training and those types of things in the toddler years. So they may regress to some of those behaviors. So bedwetting is not uncommon or maybe a younger version of talk or um, communication that they previously um, reverted to. So some baby talk or maybe they stop talking um, those kind of behaviors are pretty common. So mood swings as well, um, fear of the darker sleeping, tantrums, um, vague illnesses such as a tummy ache or headaches, diarrhea, constipations, um, colds. Children feel grief in their bodies. We all physically react to grief. And so those are some physical um, grief responses. And then withdrawal or playing quieter more often. So those are some things that might happen for a preschooler. All right, so um, we're gonna focus on the school-age child, but you know, when we talk about a school-age child, we're really talking about a pretty broad range of age. Um, you know, six to 12 years old, a six-year-old is gonna grieve very differently than a 12-year-old. So it's a really large um, age range. And so we're going to focus mainly on the younger school age. So really thinking about um, six to eight years old is the main focus of um, what we're going to talk about here in this presentation. So um, school age children, younger children may still have magical thinking. So carrying on from um, the preschool child, some the younger kids of a school age children may still have that magical thinking where two plus two doesn't always equal four. And so again, that concrete language um, can be really helpful. So talking about the body in its physical sense when talking about death. 
So death is when a body stops working and it stops working forever. Our heart stops beating. We stop eating. We can't hear or feel or think. Um, and so those are some ways to talk about the body and how it has stopped working. And that's um, easier for a child to understand with that younger age um, vocabulary and as they're really starting to begin to understand um, these concepts of death. So the younger school age um, are just beginning to understand the true meanings of death. Um, and as the years pass, the children will gain more and more understanding. So again, as I mentioned, um, the six-year-old in school age range is going to be grieving or expressing their grief or understanding grief a little bit differently than the 12-year-old in this age, same age range. So they're beginning to understand that once dead, always dead, always dead. So the permanency piece is um, becoming more um, comprehensive to them and they're understanding that better and um, being able to piece that together. And they're able to comprehend that others die, but still find it hard to believe that they can die. So that that understanding of that all living things um, will die is still something that they're trying to understand and, and working through. Um, but they can understand that others will die and, and still find it a harder thing to believe that they themselves can die or someone very close to them could. Um, and they may be fascinated with the physical state of death. So the process, um, the condition, the embalming. Sometimes um, parents are concerned about the questions that they're being asked because they seem really um, direct in this way and, and that fascination of the physical state. And that's a, it's normal, it's common for kids to have those questions as they're trying to understand death. They may be more protective of caregivers, so um, they're a little um, less egocentric than the younger kids, and so they're able to kind of think more about their caregivers and are becoming more um, protective in that way. So they may um, be hiding some feelings or emotions because they don't want their caregiver to um, be sad or to bring up things for their caregiver. And so you see more of those protective um, behaviors at this age. Double meaning in phrases, words can still be confusing. So um, using loss instead of death and dying, um, talking about sleeping as death, can those are things that can still be confusing. Even passed away, which is a very common phrase that we use, um, can be really confusing at this age when they're still trying to understand death. Um, and so that concrete language that I mentioned earlier about talking about the body can um, be really helpful when speaking about death and as they're understanding it. And school-aged children are going to revisit grief while moving through this developmental stage, along with all the developmental stages. Um, it's not uncommon for kids at Annie's Hope to start with us at a younger age and then come back to our programmings once they've maybe reached um, into school age or maybe they're transitioning into middle school or high school and they're really going through those teen years um, and needing that additional support again. So that's what, one of the reasons why um, our programs don't have a limit on the time since the death of the person um, because we know that everyone moves through their grief journey at their own pace and at their own speed and there are going to be times um, along that journey that maybe some support could be helpful. Um, and so they're going to um, revisit their grief. They're going to have new questions. Um, if the death happened when they were younger, their um, vocabulary and comprehension of death was different then. And so as they're getting older and they're understanding more things about death in the world around them, they're going to have new and different questions and maybe needing some support as they're learning more about the death of their person. So supporting school-aged children. Um, some things that we can do to help support a child at this age is reassuring that all feelings are okay. It's okay to feel all the feelings that they are feeling. There's nothing wrong with being mad or being mad at the person that died for dying. There's that's an okay feeling to have. Um, sometimes we have feelings of relief or um, feelings of guilt. Um, relief is a common feeling when the person was ill or um, was sick beforehand. And so feeling relief after someone died could be a complicated feeling for a young child to feel. Um, but that's an okay feeling to have. All feelings are okay. 
and then modeling that appropriate expression of feelings. So every feeling is okay. And then what do we do with those feelings and how do we cope with those feelings? So really supporting the child and trying to find those new coping skills that are going to work for them um, as they're dealing with these really heavy feelings of grief. And then patiently answering questions. So as I mentioned, um, with the younger kids, they might be asking the same questions over and over. And um, the, as they're progressing into their new developmental ages and developmental understanding, they might have similar questions that might seem similar to us, but they're asking them in different ways. Um, and so being willing and able to answer um, and repeat answers to questions, because again, that's how, they, that's how they understand, that's how they process. Um, and it's okay to say, I don't know when you don't. Sometimes um, with death and dying, there are some questions we don't know the answers to. Um, there are some questions that don't have answers. And that can be a hard thing for adults to sit with, and it can be a hard thing for children too. Um, but willing to say, I don't know. Um, and then when there's questions where someone can find the answer, helping connect them to that person that could find the answer. You know, I don't know the answer to that question, but maybe this person does and helping them connect that um, piece for them. So we went ahead and included um, some resources for um, the grieving school age child. And so these are some books um, that we have in our community resource library that Cindy was sharing about previously. Um, these are books on a variety of different topics. A lot of the ones that are here are, are um, really great for helping kids to understand the basic concepts of death and dying. When Dinosaurs Die is one of my go-tos um, for that and understanding a lot of different pieces about um, death. Um, death is stupid helps to connect with that idea that um, some of the words and phrases that we use are confusing or unhelpful um, related to grief. And then how do we find those comforts among people after someone has died and that connection and how that person we that relationship lives on. It just looks different with the person that died. The way I feel is really connecting um, to those feeling identification. So it's great for those kids that are learning all those different feelings that they're feeling and um, helping to express them. The Invisible String talks about that invisible connection that we have with that person that has died and all the people in our life that who have died. And After a Death um, is an activity book for children. So it's more interactive. It, it's kind of like a journal in a sense of um, prompting the children with different activities and things that they can do to help them with their grief processing. And then these are some books for preschool age children. So I mentioned When Dinosaurs Die, that's still a really good one for this age as well. Lifetimes talks about how all living things do die. And so it goes through the lifetime of all different animals and living creatures um, and also people. And then Sesame Street When Families Grieve is a really great resource um, and a fun one for kids at this age. Um, and then I mentioned The Way I Feel, which is that feelings identification book. So um, I previously mentioned some um, common reactions um, for grieving kids for preschoolers. So this is some common reactions for grieving children kind of across um, ages of the ones that we've talked about. So some of these might be um, repeated from what I mentioned earlier, but I wanted to go through and give you kind of a fuller list um, of some common grief reactions for kids between um, preschool and young school age. So afraid of um, going to bed, afraid of hospitals, physicians, their offices, repeated illnesses. So we talked about that upset stomach, um, diarrhea, those types of things, um, that physical grieving. Uh, clinging to the parent or guardian, so that attachment piece, wanting to be um, closer to them or fear of being away from them, that separation can be challenging. 
Changes in schoolwork, so we can see an increase in um, grades and we can also see a decrease in grades. Something we know about um, grieving kids is that concentration can be really difficult. Um, they have a lot of things going on in their brain that they're kind of working through or maybe they're getting distracted more often of thinking about the person or other really big concepts that they're dealing with. Um, so schoolwork can be challenging, but we can also see where they dive in more deeply with schoolwork because it's a distraction for them. Intense anger at self or others, night nightmares, tantrums, fighting, hurtful behaviors towards self or hurtful behaviors towards others, destruction of property, um, over or under eating, so changing in that eating ha um, habits, bedwetting, so talk again about that regressive behavior that, you know, Commonly, we'll hear parents say that they um, got over this. This is something that they dealt with at a younger age, and now they're doing it again. They're not sure what's happening. And so that's a common grief beha behavior is that regressive behavior. Um, cruelty towards animals, withdrawal from friends or families, and obsession with death. So we talked a little bit about that, wanting to know more about the physical state of death. Um, difficulty concentrating, oversleeping, and difficulty sleeping. So a lot of bedtime um, behaviors are common too. So I just want to thank you guys so much for having Annie's Hope here and um, getting the opportunity to share with you all about grieving children. And um, Cindy and I, we just wanted to provide our information for you. So if you have any questions about any of the information that we provided today or want to learn more about our programs or services, um, you can email Cindy or I or you can call the office. We're open um, Monday through Friday between 9 and 5. And you can just call the office and speak with any one of our program staff. It could be myself, it could be Cindy, or it could be any one of our program staff that can get you connected to our programs if you're interested or answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, ladies. That was really, that was very useful information, um, especially as a parent. Um, because, I mean, I have little ones and it's like, oh, I guess that would be kind of confusing saying somebody went to sleep or this person went here. I didn't really even think about it that way. So that's really helpful. And I'm going to share that with the families that I see as well. Because honestly, like even when something happens with a pet, you know, it's hard to describe what is happening, especially when they're so small. They don't they don't quite get it yet. <laughs> So, um, yes, absolutely. And pet deaths can often be our first introduction into death and dying and um, can be a really teachable moment um, for um, later grief to come. Yeah. All right. I think I've stopped it. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. Absolutely. Um, and we have your information. And I believe that Tara has... Um, your presentation so we can give that to some parents if they're interested in it as well. Perfect. Thank you guys. That was so good. I caught the tail end of it because I was at visits, but that was some really good information mm -hmm. for sure. Awesome. We are so thankful to um, present to you guys today. So thank you for thinking of us. Oh yeah. Well, and having it on our website for when families are dealing with that kind of situation is going to be so good because we can just shoot them there and then they can connect with you guys further too. So it's yes. great. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having us. And then if you or your colleagues have any questions or parents, please um, have them reach out to us. We'd be happy to speak with them. We will for sure. Thank you so much. Awesome. Have a great thank night. You too. All right. Bye-bye.